Thank you, Dave, for coming and, and leading this morning. Um, you know, it's, it's just as it's always interesting and fun to hear somebody else speak, um, like myself. You know, I know everybody always enjoys it. I'm joking. Um, but, you know, for me, I love hearing other people speak. You know, it, it gets, it, it brings a new light to, to different things whenever you hear other people's perspectives on it. Um, it's the same way whenever we get a guest, a guest uh, worship leader in here. Um, we've, got, we've got our regular teams, and thank you guys for doing all you do. Um, Mark and Linda and, and Steve when he leads, and, and Travis and, and Carrie and Annie, um, that team. But, you know, there is something about getting somebody who's fresh and, and different, and, and it breaks up our routine a little bit. So I just want to say thanks, Dave, for, for being willing to come over and, and lead us this morning. Um, he led last night at his church, so um, he was able to come lead this morning here. So um, Now, as everybody knows, whenever I lead, whenever I preach, I, get, I like to mix things up a little bit, right? And there's always something a little different whenever, whenever TJ is in charge. It might be order of service. It might be something. So this morning's weird little thing that we're going to do is we're going to play a quick game of Simon Says. All right? So I need everybody to stand back up. Oh, man, you got me. See, all you guys just lost. All of you guys just lost. Simon says sit down. Simon says the game is over, okay? That's what you get for following. I, it wasn't TJ says. It was Simon says. Okay, that really does have something to do with the sermon. It wasn't just to get a good laugh out of everybody this morning. Okay, that really does go along with what we're talking about. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about the will of God. Okay, a lot of I've had a lot of conversations over the years with different people who are trying to figure out what the will of God is. And for me, sometimes it's really intimidating getting to speak up here because a lot of people in the church have been saved a lot longer than I've been alive. And so speaking to older, older people who, who are way more mature in Christ than I am can be very intimidating. But I've learned over the past years that there is something that everybody can learn. When we stop learning from God, we stop growing in God, and then we might as well just die, right? Because we've, we've learned, we, we've arrived at that point. But I was having, I've had some conversations over the years and especially over the past couple of months with some people who are, they just flat out say, I want to know what the will of God is. I want to do God's will in this. You've got a big decision coming up. What's God's will? I just want to do what's God's will. You know, and I've had people who are twice my age ask me, you know, in conversations, I just want to do God's will. Well, we can pray about it and we can, um, try to discern that, right? But we trivialize it a whole lot because all we want to do is do what God desires from us, right? We just want to know what it is that God is calling us to do. What does God want from TJ? That's God's will for TJ's life is what God wants for me, right? Fill in that blank. This morning, we're going to look at the question, what does God want from your name? Okay, that's, that's what we're hoping to walk away with today. Now, a lot of people, like I said, trivialize it quite a bit. Man, what is it? I just want to do God's will. What should I have for dinner tonight? More importantly, what am I going to have for lunch after church this morning, right? Like, we're already thinking that. What's God's will there? Where should we go on vacation? I just want to make sure that we're doing God's will when we go on vacation. We've got to use our time properly, make sure that we're not being too outrageous with what we're spending, right? Those are some silly examples, but, you know, I've heard it said. You know, I've, I've, I've heard people talk about that. Some of the bigger examples, though, big moves in our lives, right? When Carrie and I got ready to move out here, and we've talked about this a whole lot because it's, it's a big thing, or whenever we got ready to, when I was graduating college and we were looking for churches to go on staff at, man, we... We went and visited a church in Texas that we thought, oh, this could be cool. 
But a little ways into the thing, we knew, all right, this isn't for us. And then we went to Massachusetts, and they offered the position, and we prayed about it, and we thought, you know, this is definitely God's will, right? After I left that church, um, and we moved back to Missouri, we were still looking for positions, and man, there was a position in, in Pueblo, Colorado, that we went and we candidated at, and it was a great fit. The pastor liked us. The, the youth workers liked us. The music pastors on the way to the airport said, you should be getting a call in a couple of days type of thing. And about a month later, it wasn't God's will, and it was devastating, right? Because it was my will, right? And sometimes we get those two things confused. Um, big moves, changing jobs, who to marry, right? Those are all big things that we think God has got a specific will and plan for our life in. But we're going to look this morning and see how untrivial God's will for our life is, because it is very simple. Um, this is a study that, or a sermon series that I've wanted to preach for a while, but I know I needed a couple of weeks to do it, and usually you only, I only get one at a time. Um, and so I, I've been thinking about this one for a while and praying about it. And since I've got next week, I'm like, all right, it's a two-part, the will of God series. Um, but it's not a trivial thing. It's, it's spelled out very simply in the book right here. God's will for our life is very, very simple, simply explained here. Not always a simple thing to do, but it's simply laid out here for us. A lot of times, like I was saying, it's, it's like this hidden, we, we think it's this hidden message that we're looking for, Right? Like when you ask your wife what's wrong and she says nothing, but you know there's something, right? What's really wrong? And you have to dig and you have to dig and you have to dig to get at it. And finally, after you've asked 75 times, she's like, fine, you know, and, and your, whole, your whole evening's gone, right? Because trying to figure out, that's not how it is with God. God doesn't want it to be trivial like that. So he laid it out for us. This morning, before we get into the message, let's pray again. God, we come before you right now just uh, praying that you speak through me, as, as Dave said. Lord, I just pray that your words come out, Lord. Not mine, but yours. Um, I thank you for the music and, and setting up how you did for this, this message, Lord, and, and laying those songs on Dave's heart. God, I pray that uh, you just help me speak to somebody here today in your name. Amen. So the first part of doing the will of God is very simple, okay? It's this. Be set apart. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7, you can turn there real quick. We're going to do a lot of turning because there are very specific scriptures in the Bible that talk about what it is that God wants from us. Because God's will is God's desire for us, right? A will. If if you look at like a legal will, it is where you want your things to go when you when you die, right? Where you want your possessions to go. What you want to be done with those things. Well, my desires are different than God's desires, and we're going to talk about that next week. But God's will for our life is what he wants us, what he expects from us as Christians. And the first thing he expects from us is to be set apart. Now, these aren't in any magical number. Actually, number three is the first one, but it made sense to go last, all right? So um, be set apart. We need to be set apart. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 7 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his or own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. God's will for us is to be set apart from the world. We are called to be different. That is one of God's major things that he wants for you. He wants you to be set apart. He doesn't want you to look like the world, right? He doesn't want you to be indistinguishable from the world. He wants you to be set apart. Sanctification in verse 3 simply, it literally means to be set apart for a special use or purpose. 
we can't be set apart if we're knee deep in it, right? If we're up to our necks and we look like the world from here down, we can't be set apart, right? We've got to be totally and completely set apart. That is God's will for our life. First and foremost is being set apart. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of your mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, some Bibles, some versions say this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. He's calling us to be different, right? As Christians, you shouldn't look like your coworkers. You shouldn't speak like your coworkers. You shouldn't act like your coworkers, right? We are called to be set apart. Um, First, First Thessalonians there is talking about purity, right? It's talking about abstaining from sexual immorality. But that's not, all it's, like, that's not all that is included in that. Matthew Henry's commentary says adultery is, of course, included. The fornication is particularly mentioned. And other sorts of uncleanliness are also forbidden, of which it is a shame even to speak, though they are done by too many in secret, right? Being pure isn't just what you see on the outside, You have to do, you have to be pure and set apart all the time, right? Because what you do in secret shows who you really are. We talk to our kids all the time about integrity, right? We're trying to teach them to to be a young woman and a young man of integrity. And integrity is what you do when nobody is looking. Who you really are when nobody is around is who you really are. And we live in a very impure world. It is easy to become impure when nobody is around. It is very easy to not be set apart in your private life. We've got to make sure that we're guarding that because God knows, right? You want to do God's will? You be pure. You be set apart in that way. When we aren't protecting our eyes, our thoughts, and our actions then we begin to look like the world. We're no longer being set apart. God doesn't want a, an impure people. God wants a pure, he wants pure people, right? We're all going to mess up, okay? The day that you don't mess up is the day that you are at heaven's gates, okay? You are going to mess up until the day you die. But we should strive for that purity. We should strive to be set apart, We shouldn't strive to look different than the world. When we live like the world, we can't honor God. When you're out in the world and you look like them, you're not pointing people to Jesus. I've dealt with too many people over the years who don't want anything to do with Christianity, who don't want anything to do with church because of what one person, how one person acted in one instance. How one person's lifestyle totally contradicted everything that they were for, that they said that they were for. When we're living like the world, we're not pointing others to God. As we're going to see, there's kind of an overlining theme here. God's will for our lives ultimately is to point others to Him to draw others to a saving knowledge of him. And we're going to keep going through that. We're called to holiness, right there in the last part of the verse. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. We are to strive to be like God, to be like Christ. Can we ever reach that goal? Is there any way to reach that goal here on earth? No, because we're all born with a sin nature. We all have that flesh that lives within us, that we have to fight every day. But we are to strive to be like Christ. We are to strive to be set apart. And one way that we can do that, it's, it's a building block thing, right? The will of God, there's many parts, is to have an attitude of worship. 
Dave talked about it a while ago. Pastor Steve talked about it last week. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 talks about it. Right, Pastor Steve talked about last week um, as he was finishing up his series on living for grace, how worship isn't just what we just did. That's not worship. That's not, that's not all worship is, right? Singing a few songs on Sunday morning, that's not all worship is. Worship is so much more. Worship is a lifestyle. First, First Thessalonians 5.16, I bet we could all say it, right? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the what? The will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Right? This is the will of God. You want to know what the will of God is for your life? Do a quick search on the will of God. It's very plainly there, right? It even says, this is the will of God in Christ for you, to do these things. Now, this is a whole attitude. These three verses are an attitude. Because can we really always be rejoicing? No. I mean, that, that's pretty hard to do. But it's an attitude. Rejoice always. Be joyful. That's what that first part's talking about. Being joyful. Now, are there times when you're going to be pretty grumpy in life? Definitely. Right? You stub your toe on the bed. You get out of bed and you stub your pinky toe on the, on the bedpost. You're going to be joyful then? <laughs> Let's be honest, guys. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to be very impure in your thoughts at that point, I'm sure, right? <laughs> Saying those Christian curse words, going all, uh, oh, um, the guy with the mustache from the Looney Tunes. Sassafras, Yosemite Sam, that's it. Yeah, going all Yosemite Sam on, on us, right? Um, <clears throat> but we are called to always be joyful because we have the joy of salvation in our life. As Christians, we have a huge thing to be joyful for. We have the, the joy of Jesus, right? How many of you guys can read? I'm not going to sing it because you don't want me to sing. That's why we brought Dave in this morning because nobody wants me to, right? But I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, right? I've got that joy that, 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 that passes everything. We, that joy stems from the fact that we get to talk and be with God at all times. There is never a time as a Christian that we are separated from God. And that is a joyful thing. That is a thing that should bring us pure joy, right? Everybody, you, you might be sitting there thinking, man, I, I really don't have anything in my life to be joyful about right now. Okay, but there's been a time in your past when there was that thing that brought you joy, right? Asking or being asked to marry your, love, your, your spouse, right? That first time you got to hold that little baby in your arms, oh man, I remember the very first time I got to hold Addison. She was almost a day old because of some of the trauma she went through before I finally got to hold her. But Carrie still got a picture that, that's probably one of her favorite pictures of, of, Carrie, of Addison and I. And, and it's the first time I got to hold her. And she's, I mean, I'm a big guy and, I, and she's just so tiny. And, and it's that little thing brought so much joy into my life, right? Those are the, that joy that, that I experienced there is nothing compared to the joy that Jesus brings into my life. Nothing compared that that moment that you're thinking of doesn't hold a candle to the joy that God brings into our lives when we allow him and, and we start this rejoicing process. The second part of that, of that attitude of worship is pray without ceasing. Who's praying right now? Come on, raise your hand. Oh, no, okay. We're not praying right now, right? You're only praying right now because I just said that, right? It's not something that we can physically do all of the time, right? Because you can't, my brain can't be talking to God and preaching here and thinking about what I'm going to be speaking that, right? I can't do that. My brain doesn't work that way. Maybe yours does. And if it does, we need to talk and maybe you can train me how to do that, right? Because I can't do that. I mean, and honestly, I drive all day, every day, and it probably wouldn't be safe if I was closing my eyes praying all day. 
You know, that'd probably be bad news. It's not talking about continually praying. You need to be in continual communication with God. God wants us to be uh, continually in communication with Him. Being in a place to where you can just say, God, this is what's going on. Talk to Him like a best friend, a reverence, right? But there's always that line. You're always in an attitude of being able to approach God. There have been times in my life that I know of that I can look back and think, it's going to do me no good to talk to God right now because my attitude is not there. Because I am so low in, in this, this depth of despair that I can't even think about being able to talk to God. That's not praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing is, is having that attitude of, my prayers aren't going to bounce off the ceiling. They're going straight to God and He's hearing them. Being ready and accepting of, of that, right? Being in that attitude of prayer. And the third thing here is giving thanks in everything, right? Give thanks in all circumstances. That's another tough one, right? That is a toughie. Because we don't like to give thanks when things are going bad. How many of you can think of a time when something went really bad and your first thought was, praise God? Right? That's exactly, Mark. That's usually our last thought. That's usually the last place our mind goes. Same with praying without ceasing, going back to that. Sometimes that's the last place our mind goes too, right? I'm trying to figure out what God's will is for my life. Have you prayed about it? Not yet. Are you really seeking God's will? No. You know, um, somebody's going in for surgery. That should be the first place our mind goes. We're going to backtrack a minute to the last point to pray without ceasing because it, it, you know, we need to have it to where that is the first place we go when things get tough is into prayer. That is the first place our mind needs to go, not the last place, which it does so many times. I've tried this. I've tried this. I've tried that. I've talked to this person. Have you prayed about it? Not yet. Or I'm going to get to it. It should never be an afterthought, right? It should always be the first thought. Just like giving thanks in all circumstances should be. It's easy, because we're human, right? To see the bad thing, the bad side of everything. To see the bad side of life is easy and it's kind of natural. And it's more natural for some people than it is others, right? We all know that super negative person who can't see the good side of anything. Here's $100. I really could have used 150 You know, or, oh, here's this vacation. Oh, you went on vacation? Yeah, but we only got to go for five days. I would love a five-day vacation right now, you know? There's always something wrong, and that's not how we should be. We need to give thanks in all situations. Those are silly little things that should make anybody happy, right? But what about when things go really wrong? What about when, for me, I can remember, I've lost two grandparents. I lost two grandparents pretty close to each other. And I, I was thankful. First and foremost, thankful, because I knew both of them were going to heaven. Second, both of them had been suffering for a long time right? It's easy in those times, but what about a sudden loss? You know, last year, Carrie lost an aunt very suddenly. Karen lost a sister very suddenly. At that time, it wasn't something to be thankful for, right? It wasn't, that's not where my mind went. But looking at all the lives that she had touched, that's when you can be thankful for those circumstances, for the people when Steve did the funeral, for the people who got to hear the gospel for the first time because she had so many people at the funeral, right? That's when, man, thankful for that circumstance, right? We just completed as a young, the young married small group that we've been going through just completed a series called Love and Respect. And probably it was a really good series um, all throughout I think anybody could benefit from it, whether you've been married six months, whether you've been married 60 years. You know, there's always something to learn on on how to uh, treat your spouse. 
But this one, this, there's a, there was a quote from our last, lesson, or our last uh, lesson that really stuck out to me, and it made me think, whenever I was prepping this and going through this, really brought a light to giving things in all circumstances. He said, my response is my responsibility. Now, he was talking about responding to your spouse. But my response in all of these situations, in whatever life throws at me, in whatever God allows me to go through, my response is my re- responsibility. How I react to that, how, how I view it, is my responsibility, right? God's allowing me to go through this for some reason. I, if, I, if I'm having a thankful heart, if I'm in that mindset, if I'm really pursuing God's will and living in God's will, I need to see the silver lining in it, right? I need to find out what is it that God is teaching me through this. You think about Job. Man, that dude's response was phenomenal, right? Never once did he bat an eye at God. Never once did he blame God for anything, right? When his, worst, when his friends and wife said, dude, just curse God and die, he said, I won't. None of us have been in a situation nearly as bad as Job's, I promise you. You might think that you've been in some pretty bad situations, but you've never lost all of your kids and half of your possessions and your wife turn your back on you and your friends turn her back on you, right? His response was, God is great. Thank you for, obviously he chose me to go through this. Find the silver lining in things. Find out what it is that God's wanting you to learn from this, right? As many of you know, I haven't had a relief driver at work since the beginning of August, right? So I've been working a lot of Saturdays, six days a week, and there are times when Carrie and I were just like, all right, time to start looking for a new job, right? But then I've got to step back and be like, all right, but the paychecks are good. I've still got time to spend with the family. I've still got time to be in God's word so that I can prep for for a message, right? Yes, I don't have as much free time as I would like, but you know what? There's a silver lining to it. I get to see Ralph more often out on the route, right? I get to run into some of some of my other customers more frequently. I get to get to invest in them. It gives me more opportunities to speak to them. And it's at, th- at those moments that I'm like, all right, God's got a reason for this. This isn't the first time it's happened. I've got 30 years ahead of me. Probably won't be the last time that I'm working like this, right? So in those situations, it's easy to get grim, right? Because I've got two kids and I've got a wife and I've got other responsibilities that I really don't want to be working six days a week, especially during the holiday season. I had vacations that got ruined because of it. But God's blessed, right? And when you start to see that, it makes those situations not as bleak. It makes those things that God's letting you go through or that you're going through because you've stumbled into them a little better, a little easier to handle. So we need to be set apart. We need to have an attitude of worship. And lastly, which is really the first thing, is God wants us to have eternal life. God wants everybody to have eternal life. Over in 1 Timothy 2, it's where we're going to look at next, um, 1 through 4, it talks all about this, about how it's the will of God, the desire, the version that we're reading from the ESV says it's the desire of God, right? We talked in the beginning how the will of God is the desire for our life. It says in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, first of all, then, I urge that supplications prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Goes back to that attitude of prayer, right? Be praying for people. Be thankful. Be be giving a, a thankful attitude in your prayers. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. It is God's desire for everyone to come to know God. And you know what? There is no point in trying to be set set apart 
to be different than the world, to have an attitude of worship, if first off, you aren't a child of his. If you are not a child of God, you cannot live in God's will, right? It's very hard. If you, if you think about it, like we talked about a while ago briefly, you know, your will when you die, you got this legal document. You have to be written into that, right? And children are typically written into, into their parents' wills. There are some situations where maybe not because bad blood or whatever. But it's God's will for his children to live this way. It's God's desire for his children to be set apart, to have an attitude of worship. But if you aren't one of his children, it doesn't matter. You cannot live the will of God apart from being a child of God. It is impossible. You might think you are. You might think, but I'm a really good person. But if you're not a child of God, you can't live his will. If you are not a child of God, you cannot be walking with him. You cannot be pointing others to him because you're going to slip up and fall and you're just another reason that somebody won't come to church. You're now the reason that somebody has been like, all right, well, church, Christianity, they're a bunch of phonies. Well, you were a phony in the first place, right? As Christians, we should be praying for and pointing others to Christ. Once you become a child of God, it is now your job to pray for others and point them to a loving relationship and a knowledge of God. It's God's ultimate desire that people come to a saving knowledge of Him. This is what He wants for for you. You want to know God's true will for your life. First off, you have to be a child of His. Second off, you need to be pointing others to him. Maybe you're here today. I don't see very many new faces. I see some that I don't know. But that doesn't mean that you haven't been living a whole long time thinking you're saved. If you aren't truly saved, if you've never entered into a relationship with Christ, that's the first step to following God's will, to knowing God's will for your life. That is it. That is where it all starts. Because you can't, like I said, you can't be set apart. You can have an attitude of worship and you might think that you're set apart, but it's not real. The first thing you have to do is admit that you're a sinner, right? You have to, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's nobody in here who hasn't sinned. You might think, oh, I've led a pretty good life. Yeah, but you've sinned. You were born with a sin nature. You're born sinful, I did not have to teach my kids how to tell a lie. I did not have to teach my kids how to hit each other. They just knew, right? We are born with that sin in our life. Then you have to believe. Romans 5.28 said that God demonstrated his love toward us, even that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We have to believe that God died on the cross for us. Believe that Jesus Christ came down, lived 33 years on the earth, and died and paid a price for our sins. Because there is a price for sins, and that is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Then we've got to confess. Romans 10 9 says, Confess with the heart or mouth and believe in the heart, and you will be saved. You will come to that saving knowledge of Christ, that saving knowledge that is important, that is very real to be in the will of God. That is God's desire, is for you to make sure that you are saved, to make sure that you have followed those steps. And then you're pointing others that way. Because God's desire is that none should perish. In closing this morning, to live according to God's will isn't some mystery, right? I hope this morning as I have went through these three points, that you, maybe the will of God has become a little more clear, a little less scary. Because it can be, right? Because we put, we put too many things on it. But God's will for our life is first and foremost to have eternal life. To make sure that if once we have it, that we're pointing others to that knowledge, to that saving relationship with him. 
Secondly, to have an attitude of worship. To make sure that we are communing with Him. That we are ready to give Him praise. Because when we're in that attitude, when we have that attitude of worship, that lifestyle of worship, what is it doing? It's pointing others to Him. And to be set apart. Because when we don't look like the world, and when we're joyful in all things, and when we're pure in all things, what's the world see? Something different, right? And when they see how you are handling things, how you don't crack those jokes, how you don't laugh at those jokes, how you respect the women and the men that come into your, come through your office or come wherever, and you don't have the same sense of humor and the same way of thinking as them, what's that do? There's something different about you. And when life gets tough for them, who are they going to come to first? And what can you do when you're set apart? You can then point others to God. The will of God for our lives as Christians, once we've entered into that saving relationship with Him, once we've come to that saving knowledge of Him, are the will of God in our life, for your life, for my life, is to point others to Him. Next week, we're going to look at how, how that plays out. How, how my will versus God will, God's will looks. How, my, how, how me as a sinner and a human and a fleshly creature can affect God's will and, and vice versa. But this morning, if you are here this morning and you've never entered into that relationship with Christ, do it after church. Find me. Find, find one of the deacons. Dave, I know, would be happy to talk to you. Whoever you feel comfortable talking with. And you're like, you know what? I need some more information about that. It doesn't matter how long you've been in this church. If you aren't saved, it, you're, just coming to, you're just coming to a building. It doesn't matter if you have thought you were saved for many years, but you haven't been living that lifestyle. Maybe it's time for a rededication. I don't know. You know your heart. You know the purity level. You know whether you're living according to God's will or not. You and God, and that's it. Let's pray.